Does your presentation have sound? No. Perfect. Not at all. And we'll go here. Thank you for being here. It looks like we have just about as many panelists as we have guests, but I have noticed that there are most most important people have come today, so thank you. I'm going to talk to you today about a course that I have been working to design for either the last couple of years or depending on how you look at, look at it for more than a decade. And it's a microbiology capstone course, which means that it is a course designed for junior and senior level microbiology students. And it is a problem-based course. It's also a service-based course. So it is very unique in the world of science. And that's why maybe the term culture and justice is a good one for describing it, because our projects are all based in community problems and community organizations. So I want to tell you uh, just a little bit about all the people who make this course possible. And as I was putting together this presentation, I actually realized that it takes a village to support a course like this. And that that is very, very true. In fact, you can see part of the village up here, but this is just a very tiny portion um, of all the people that put work into the class. And the first person that I want to introduce actually is John Wilford, who is here in the back row. And John is my co-instructor for Capstone. And he, he does a lot more with the lab portion of the course. And in a moment, you'll understand why it's kind of segmented down into different portions. But obviously, we also have to have a lot of amazing community groups to serve with our projects because the core foundation of the capstone course is that we use benchtop microbiology to allow us to solve community problems. So obviously we must have some community problems to be able to address. And those come from a variety of organizations, but you can see that um, of those, we have them kind of listed at the top there. And so Acre Student Farm is one. We've worked with Acre Student Farm for two semesters now, so starting last spring semester and into this spring semester. We have done a project with Acres that you're going to hear a little bit about here in a minute regarding their compost. We've also worked with our Laramie Gardens, and actually today Peggy McCracken is here, and she was our community partner, uh, she and Athena Kennedy, so we have her representing that group. And Downtown Clinic and Long and Game and Fish are some of our new community partners this semester, and actually Dr. Anne Marie Hart was really, really sad that she couldn't be here today because she had to be at another conference. And uh, Dr. Norton from Acres also was really sad to miss today. So we have these amazing uh, community entities that we work with, but we also have a lot of other people that support the project as well. And um, this is just a, a list of those who have, in many cases, um, been actual support for funding. So this last fall semester, John and I were able to write a grant and get funding from the um, Campus Compact of the Mountain West. And this group actually supports service-based learning in the entire Mountain West region. So they actually support projects in many universities. And we were funded. We were one of the lucky projects to be funded um, by that group. Um, also, we get funding through, um, through the SLICE office. And Erin Olson, if you know Erin, has been an incredible assistance to us. We also receive funding from Elizabeth and Richard, Richard Horsch through the College of Agriculture and through the Dean's Office. And of course, we get a lot of support from the microbiology program. Uh, Dr. Andrews is here today. And, um, and molecular biology as well. 
And Dr. Meg Flanagan Skinner is, is at ECTL, and she's been incredible with us for um, helping us assess the course. Um, but also, she is incredible expertise and resource through the Elbogen Center for Teaching and Learning. And then we have people who help us out with the lab portion of the course, like helping us run PLFAs and C to N ratios and all these sort of nerdy things that we try to do in order to help community problems and doing that in the microbiology lab. So this is kind of just a, a, a brief overview of the, the village that it takes to support microbiology capstone. And I want to tell you about the process for getting this course off the ground. And it begins maybe with a story of assessment. And that is how many stories on the university campus get started. And that is that we had done some assessment in the microbiology program, but our assessment was largely indirect. And it didn't do much to assess those skill-based kinds of objectives or uh, process-based objectives. And so we really were tasked with this idea of doing a better job of direct assessment of those sorts of outcomes. And we, at, in 2011, we were actually categorized as a bottom tier program in terms of assessment, and we wanted to do better. So the development of a capstone course was one of the things that could actually allow us to do this. And in to boot, really, this was supported by uh, the university plan and, and UP plan in action item 20, actually number three, there said directly, one of the goals is to develop capstone courses. So College of Ag really wanted this to be something that they would support. And of course, the American Society for Microbiology, which is what ASM stands for, also said, hey, it's a good idea if we have these capstone courses. I think all of those things are really good reasons to develop and design a rad kind of community-based course that does amazing things. But I think that the best reason to do it is because it enhances student learning. Really, it's all about students and giving students experiences that are meaningful and transformational. And so the research also tells us that that is true of capstone courses. We see research by an Australian researcher, Coral Pepper. She says, hey, learning quality goes way up and engagement goes way up when we can use these sort of capstone courses to educate our students. Their transfer skills are better. We see that their feelings of inclusion are also um, improved. And this is where the Social Justice Symposium brings together two of the most important parts of my life, and that is microbiology and social justice. And because many of our, pro our processes are um, very oriented towards solving problems for underserved community organizations. This really brings and knits together those things. And these scholars that you see listed here are also people who try to do that as well. Um, we also know that it makes for a much more cooperative learning environment. I know some of our panelists are going to tell you just about how, how much cooperation comes into this really big deal. So uh, I would like to tell you about course design before I allow some of the students to tell you about the specific community problems that they've addressed. But with our course design, it is based in Merrill's model. And this is an instructional design model that is problem-based. So you'll notice that in my um, derivative of this problem-based model, I put the problem at the center, and then there's four phases of instruction. These four phases of instruction include activation, demonstration, um, application, and integration. Activation, that's all about, like, we remind you as a student just how much you know. And we say, remember how we learned this in an earlier class, and remember how it relates to this from another class. And we talk about things like maintaining lab notebooks and writing grant proposals. And we activate old knowledge. And during that phase, that's much of our uh, focus is on that. Demonstration is all about showing lab skills and other things that might be needed to implement the project during the application phase. And application is all about being in the lab and in the field and actually putting these skills to test in these contexts. And then integration is taking all of that and talking about how we can actually communicate it and how we can synthesize concept connection between what we've done in application and what we learn in the activation and demonstration phases. So in fact, what I was thinking is that this model, right when I was getting ready for this, this presentation, I thought, yeah, this is sort of cool, but it turns out for our kind of adaptation of Merrill's model, we should adapt it even further and make it show that application is really the biggest portion of this because it's actually putting to the test your skills in a lab setting that really is the biggest part of this. 
But all of the phases are really important, and you'll notice that one of the major adaptations that I've made in the model is that these problems are community problems. They're based in service. So with that being said, I want the students to tell you a little bit about the projects that they have done, and our panelists are students that either took the class last spring semester in the spring of 13, or they are people that took the class in this, or taking the class right now in this spring of 14. So they're going to tell you about some of the amazing projects that they are pursuing with their particular research. Okay, my name is Amy Sibel, and I'm actually one of the two peer mentors this semester. So Mara in the back and myself took the class last spring, and Rachel and John asked us to come back and be peer mentors this semester. So we do actually have our own separate project from the main class projects. Uh, we're working with the Wyoming Game and Fish and their state wildlife forensics and fish health lab. And one of the big things with Wyoming Game and Fish is that they want to be able to inspect the fish hatcheries that they have around the state. Right now we currently have about 10 fish hatcheries, 10 state fish hatcheries and 7 commercial fish hatcheries around Wyoming. And so the fish health lab's goal is to assess the health of these different fish hatcheries and determine um, whether these fish are fit for release into the water so that fishermen can go catch them, or if they're having problems with bacterial, viruses, or parasites. And specifically, one of the problems that they're having is with um, a bacteria called Flavobacterium. And there's three different species that kind of cause issues with fish health, but the main one we're focusing on is Flavobacterium cyclophyllum. This causes cold water disease, which essentially, it, it affects the really small fish and it basically eats away, it starts at their tail and basically just erodes the fish. And so it's kind of a nasty disease and can cause some pretty major fish kills. And so one of the issues that the, the Fish Health Lab is having is that they can't really identify Flavobacterium cyclophyllum very well. Um, they're having issues with trying to culture it. They're having issues with being able to test and determine that, yes, this is the bacteria we think it is. And they're also having issues with this uh, bacteria developing resistance to the antibi antibiotics that uh, this different hatcheries use to treat when they decide that they have a flavobacterium infection. And so our main goal this semester has been to kind of try and develop a quick way to identify the flavobacterium sacrophyllum from water samples. And we're finding that this is particularly difficult, one, because it's hard to culture, and two, because we don't really have a lot of tests that we can do. So we're starting to look more at molecular techniques uh, like using PCR and maybe a PF, PLFA analysis to try and determine, um, yes, they have cyclophyllum, or flavobacterium cyclophyllum, and that they can have a better way to identify rapidly the hatcheries that have this type of infection. I am a current um, capstone student this semester. Um, and I am working on a project with the downtown clinic. And unlike the rest of the students you see here, the downtown clinic is a new addition to this semester's, along with um, Amy's project also. Um, but it's a newer project, so we are really um, starting with an introduction with the clinic and some of the problems that we see associated with um, patients at the clinic currently. Um, and the patients at the clinic have reported to have um, some diarrheal issues due to antibiotic resistance. Um, so these are mostly antibiotic-associated um, diarrheal problems. And what is really neat about the project that we took on is since these um, current patients are within the Laramie area, um, very local, and the downtown clinic provides um, one of the only primary um, healthcare services in the community um, that some of our research um, hopefully can actually um, help implement some educational tools and just some background information to why these patients and why these community members are having um, such healthcare related issues, um, namely diarrheal issues due to um, pathogens, bacterial pathogens and enteric pathogens that are colonizing in their gastrointestinal tract. So specifically what we've tried to do this semester 
is take um, some of the probiotics, which the downtown clinic is currently issuing to the patients. And these probiotics um, are, su are supposed to and supposedly help um, the patients fight some of these um, enteric pathogens from causing um, antibiotic-associated problems um, with the patients while taking antibiotics. And because the patients are very resistant to taking antibiotics because it does make them sick, um, then these probiotics will hopefully um, compensate some of those issues. So we're trying to fight for the probiotics that um, the downtown clinic is distributing to the patients. Um, and hopefully seeing that they are having some competitive effects with um, the pathogens that are also infecting the patients also. So doing that in a microbial and molecular um, approach has been an uh, extremely um, task-worthy and a very insightful learning tool for me this semester. Um, not only have I really um, tried to take my passions for social justice especially in terms of healthcare and especially at a community level, but applying them to some techniques, which are um, some techniques that I've learned just this semester. Um, so it's a really neat on-hands experience to be able to apply these techniques and actually put my passions behind them. Um, and we are also looking at other um, ways besides from a probiotic approach um, with the capsule with the um, over-the-counter medication that the downtown clinic prescribes to these patients and gives to these patients, but also hopefully utilizing some more home-based, um, self-sustainable approaches. So we're actually also culturing yogurt and kombucha along with the over-counter probiotics that the downtown clinic has on hand, um, but looking at more of the cost-effective ways um, in the bacteria, the yeast, the different species that are in foods that the patients could be taking also and seeing if maybe those um, organisms have as much of an effect or an equal effect as probiotics that a patient could buy or get at the clinic. So we're um, in the first stages of this project, but um, just by looking at um, these organisms, culturing these organisms, seeing how they grow on a plate, um, we're getting a first glimpse as to how probiotics can grow and if probiotics in yogurt and kombucha and other natural sources could grow um, just as well as probiotics within a capsule or even better than probiotics within a capsule. So definitely learned a lot and um, we work every morning 7 to 8 or 7 to 9. Um, so this is just eight hours a week of great learning on hands experience for me. The first experience that I really had in a research lab um, so as a junior and as an undergraduate, having that experience with two um, faculty within the microbiology program um, <clears throat> has been something that I've really enjoyed and definitely something that I've taken to a level even um, being in Dr. Jerry Andrews um, pathogenic microbiology class. Um, these techniques have really applied and really boosted my confidence as an undergraduate student being a junior and hopefully moving on into microbiology or molecular biology in the future, and hopefully trying to utilize these social justice issues and even continue through a microbial and molecular um, perspective to help any issue that we can see creatively um, helping the society around us. So something I'm really grateful for, and many of the students also feel the same way. So, I was a, I'm, a, I'm a capstone student from last year's capstone class. I worked with the Acres Project. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt from, like, from our uh, presentation, not presentation, proposal. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, creating, creating a more sustainable country starts at a local level with local food and local production, or local food production and local food waste recycling. Thus, nationwide, there's been an increase in the number of small-scale, environmentally conscious farms. One such farm is Acres Student Farm. Located here in Laramie, the student-run 
vegetable farm. Its mission is to build a community centered around food production in a, with sustainable methods. In accordance with this mission, Acre, Acre's student farm has developed a composting program which collects 840 gallons of food waste from the community weekly. Uh, they then use this food waste, the finished compost product, to for soil remediation, to grow vegetables. Uh, the vegetables are then sold back to the community. Uh, any additional vegetables that don't get sold to community are uh, donated. Are donated to. <coughs> they're donated uh, to community organizations such as the. Uh, yeah. Uh, the soup kitchen and senior center. Oh, and share that one. Yes. Um, so to okay. Um, so there have been some serious allegations towards Acres Student Farm involved in uh, odors, odor causing like the compost causing odors within the community. Um, is threatened, so there's been threats to terminate or relocate Acres Student Farm to West Lamy, uh unless they can reduce odorous gas emissions. So we address this problem by, I guess, by assessing the microbial content, the microbial communities within the compost, and examining. Uh, Examining varieties of conditions, including aeration conditions, such as aeration with covering and aeration without covering. Um, so some things we monitor to try to reduce the odor emissions from these compost piles. We monitor uh, anaerobic and aerobic indicator organisms, the carbon-nitrogen ratio of the compost, uh, pH, ammonia, and ammonia nitrates, moisture, temperature, and the microbial community structure through PCR analysis. Um, so the research results we got continue to impact acres directly by reducing odors in the farm, farm's compost while allowing acres to continue composting at their present location. Hi, my name is Emily Lindley, and I was part of the Capstone group last year, and Amy and Mara, um, and I had a group with our learning garden and Katie's back there, I think. Um, I find it more succinct and probably more fluid if I read our project summary to you, and we summed it up really well. So, um, as food insecurity is becoming a rising global issue, local agriculture is gaining more importance within communities. In an attempt to make members of the Laramie community more food secure, two local community members have opened up their yards to build community gardens, called our Laramie Gardens, and provide fresh food, promote social connectedness, and increase vegetable and fruit consumption. The garden named the 13 had a fairly successful growing season in comparison to the second garden named the Hodge. Our objective is to determine what effects the soil and compost composition have on microbial communities in hopes that we can determine how to make the gardens more productive. Nitrogen fixing bacteria are important in plant growth. However, it is unknown whether the differences in soil and compost composition at the two local gardens have an impact on these bacteria. We will be studying how different combinations of soil and compost impact the nitrogen fixing bacteria through a, seri a time series experiment on laboratory test plots. We will also set up our test plots using unamended soil samples from our two our Laramie Garden plots. We will also collect samples of compost from one local cellar and the other out of Fort Collins, Colorado. In our test plots, we will plant lettuce and snow peas and take soil samples twice weekly for six weeks. Throughout the six weeks, we will monitor growth and examine samples of our plots as well as enumerate nitrogen fixers and by the end of the six weeks, we will take final nitrogen fixer counts, perform confirmatory PCR, perform final PLFAs, and a basic rhizosphere analysis. This research will allow us to report back to our Laramie Gardens so that they may be able to use our data to improve their crop yields in future seasons. 
By increasing the production of our learning gardens, we will be helping to increase the benefits this group provides to the community, such as sustainable food production, contribution to local food banks, and a greater community connectedness. Sorry, that was kind of long. But um, I guess aside from, I mean, I did learn a lot in laboratory techniques and data analysis, but the biggest thing that I learned was you pose a question in research, and the only thing you get is more questions. So to me, that was finding projects within my project. And also, in the majority of the labs I had been exposed to, it was like a cookbook lab. Not that I didn't learn anything out of the labs that I've done, but those experiments have already been done. Everyone already knows the answers to those. They were just for us learning purposes. But this project didn't have an answer. And it brought a lot of relevance to me, because when we go to the grocery store, do we know where our food comes from? Do you know exactly what's in your foods unless you read the label? And you still don't know where they come from. And so knowing if it can come out of your backyard, um, and that's the freshest you can get, and that you cultivated it, and that, oh, I read this quote that was like, garden, planting a garden is like having hope for tomorrow. So just getting to experience that, working with Peggy and Athena, bringing relevance to my research um, in a problem that has yet to be solved, um, really made an impact on my career and has really made me view research in a different way. So, thank you. I, uh, I'm Sean McCracken, I'm Maggie's son, and uh, I'm a current student in uh, the microbiology capstone class. Um, I'm in the Acres group that's uh, working on the Acres project this year. Um, and specifically this year, we, we looked at the results from last year's group, and um, one of their, their biggest results was the carbon nitrogen ratio of the compost piles was all out of whack. Um, and so we tried to figure out um, what we could do to adjust the carbon nitrogen ratio. Um, currently at Acres, they've been using straw to try and mend their compost to um, help alleviate this problem. Um, and this year we, we um, also amended our compost with straw. And, um, but we also had test piles using paper, um, shredded paper to see if that would be um, better. Um, and so uh, this, this research project, uh, it really, for me, is a way for me to tackle a problem that there isn't necessarily a right answer to um, and look at it and eliminate possible wrong answers in order to get to the right answer, if there's a right answer. Um, and that's, in my opinion, what research is all about, is, is exploring how things work and the interactions between things. And that's what this project is for me, at least. Um, I can see how amending compost with paper versus amending it with straw or, or putting aeration pipes in it or covering it will change the microbial composition, will change the pHs, the temperatures, those sorts of things. And, and that's something that you can't get out of another class. Um, it's really um, a meaningful way to go about doing research in, not, in a setting that isn't necessarily a research lab more of a course setting. Um, and that's something that I think that this class does really well. Um, an example of this is if uh, I have an idea for how to go about solving a problem or culturing the bacteria, I may have a great idea and I can try and implement it. And if it doesn't work, then I have to figure out why it doesn't work. I can't just go to the instructors and be like, hey, Rachel, why did this work? You know, I, I, can, I can talk with them and discuss it, and then I'll, I can figure it out on my own. And that's really, in my opinion, what's important because you don't have those interactions in other labs, in other classes. You go and you look through your lab manual and you follow the instructions and then you hopefully get results. And if you don't, oh well, um, it's kind of a bummer, but you, you know you, you can't really troubleshoot why you didn't get results. Or if you did get results, you don't necessarily understand why. Um, and that's really what this class does that, that I think is one of the most valuable things um, that I have really appreciated about it. Hi, I'm Mara, and I'm one of the peer mentors with Amy. I think her and Emily did a great job summarizing our project, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore. But what this class has done for me, and um, mainly it's us taking charge of our own education. Um, Rachel and John plant the seeds, and then we grow from there. And it's um, kind of like Sean talked about taking what we think we should do with the project and running with that. And they know things are going to go wrong and sometimes things are going to go right, but it's us getting to that point. And um, Amy and I have done a lot with it this year that there's so many things going wrong and Rachel and 
John aren't saying, well, do this differently next time. Instead, they're saying, what do you think you should do now? And it is different than any other class. Not that all of my other classes haven't been great here at UW, but this is such a different experience for you to take charge of yourself and your own future. Um, it, it should be offered to everyone. I think it's an amazing opportunity. And we have a great group of seven here, but if this could reach far more people, it would be an incredible opportunity for them. And I'm so grateful that I not only got to take the class, but now I get to mentor and watch other people grow through it too. And I get to grow myself as, I guess, a teacher and helping other people along with their problems too. So. I don't know that I can say much more than what our panelists are saying, but I am going to try. <laughs> and I hope that one of the things that came through in many of their testaments is that the communication between our students and the community entities is really central to this course. And I was pretty excited with, you know, when when Peggy sees, you know, Mara or or you know, Emily, she knows them and she feels like she has an already established connection with them, you know, if they meet up at the farmer's market one day. And I think that that is a testament to the kind of communication and the kind of depth of communication that happened between our community groups and our students. And so this is further, this slide is further showing the central role that communication plays in this course. And in fact, if we come down to one word that I think describes the most important learning objective of this course, it is communication, which is not a bad deal because most recent studies have shown that that's the number one thing that employers are looking for in their graduates. And also, as we all know, right now we're in the midst of USP changes and the calm courses are coming onto the scene. And so this is being recognized in our university also as being one of the central missions. So if we situate this within course design, what you can see is that the beginning stages of the project, and many of our students read to you from their formal research proposals, they write a, a formal NSF style research proposal. So we go through a lot of pretty heavy text reading on NSF style proposals and how to write them. We do a lot of teamwork on how to assess these style of proposals. And then they sit down and they first write their own. And and then they work as a team to write a team proposal. And we do a very highly iterative process until finally we have a, a proposal that we're very happy with. And that proposal is what goes off to our community partner. And then the community partner often gives us feedback from that proposal. So you can notice that the communication arrows go both ways from community, from us, from community partner to us when they tell us about their problem, and then from us when we to them when we tell them about our proposed um, research proposal for solving that problem, or I shouldn't say solving it, I should say addressing it, knowing that we might not solve anything. And then we, we, we go into the lab and we work through the hypothesis testing because in that proposal, the students put forth both um, all three objectives, hypotheses, and specific aims that they will try to address with their hypothesis testing in the lab. And then we also have at the very end of the course that integration phase where they do make a poster that actually pulls together their research findings and we talk about how to communicate the findings that you've gained in the lab setting and turn those around into something that will be meaningful not, not only for those that are in your field to, to hear but also for those outside of your field. And so then those are communicated back to the community service organization and then they communicate back with us with an assessment. So assessment is also right, a very big part of this. And what you'll notice in the bottom portion of our, our course design model is that you can see that we, throughout each one of these phases, we do assess all of the skills that we hope that students will have. So we assess their ability to, to generate hypotheses, their ability to engage in literature review, their ability to write and communicate through writing. But then we also do assess their ability to get in the lab and use skills to test their hypotheses, to interpret their data. And then we assess their ability to orally present those data and to talk to both people inside and outside of the discipline. So all of those things are built into our instructor rubrics. We have lots and lots of rubrics. Um, and they're also built into rubrics that we use for external subject matter experts. We have people come to the poster presentation that are that are practicing microbiologists and or they're practicing scientists in some area. And we 
we even brought in one of our, our external subject matter experts from, from a distance last time. He was one of my alumni, and he actually works at an environmental engineering firm in Seattle, and he uh, works as their bioremediative specialist. So he was able to come in and be one of the external uh, assessors of the project. So we get a lot of um, communication right, at the heart of this entire this entire course. And already our panelists have talked a little bit about what makes Capstone different from other courses that they've taken. And I think some of them said a little bit more about that than others. But if um, any of you would like to add that maybe, I know Amy, you stayed pretty close to just talking about the project. If there's anything you want to add about what really, you know, part of this design makes Capstone different than any other lab you've taken. Um, yeah, I guess I'll add to that. So I guess what makes Capstone a little bit different for me is that you're doing bench top science, which is great. Those are the skills you've learned throughout your entire college career. But it really gets to the question of who cares? Like, I've been in classes like, okay, cool, I isolated this protein, that's awesome, but who cares? <laughs> and so this class has really been able to take what I'm doing on the bench top and be able to apply it to a real world situation. It's like, Oh, well, Peggy cares because it's her garden and she wants to know how to you know, make it more productive. Or the people that are uh, getting service at the downtown clinic, they want to know, like, okay, is this probiotic going to help me or is it just kind of there? And so I think it's really helping answer the question of why do we do benchtop science? Like, who is it actually helping? And so along with learning, you're also helping others learn as well because you can answer, who cares, and how can I explain this to them? Uh, I really enjoyed this course because I felt like it brought the whole scientific experience from the start with establishing a need for research, and then like to the end where you're to performing research, collecting data, um, and then presenting your findings to, you know, to someone that does care. I mean, it really kind of brought science out of, you know, like everyone's saying, the cookbook of science, the cookbook of lab work. And it really I don't know, just connected the dots. It, it made it powerful. I just said speaker. Um, the other great thing I think about Capstone is. In every other class, we're growing as students, which is great. That's the point of coming to college and going to class every day. But with Capstone, I feel like we're growing as human beings, too, because we are going out into the community and we're learning how to communicate what we've learned in class. And that's, we have a microbiology background, but Peggy doesn't. And the other people we work with, they don't always have a background in that. So it's learning how to take what you know and put it into words that they can understand. And that's huge. That's real world application. We're not going to be stuck in classrooms the rest of our lives. We have to go out there and help teach. Whether or not we work in academia or not, we still have to be able to take our background and share it with the rest of the world. And I think that's huge with Capstone. You don't see that in every other class. John, would you comment on how it's different from any other class you've ever taught? Yeah. Um, so I can I can comment on that both as as an instructor and and as somebody who runs the labs and, and sets up labs. So um, it's it's so much different than anything that, that I've ever taught. You know um, you know any class that you teach you want to try to have investment or or somewhere that that you can uh, facilitate engagement for students. And I, I think that here it, it just comes so naturally that. Um, having our community partners come in and talk, I, I don't even really have to try <laughs> you know, to facilitate engagement because Peggy facilitates engagement, or Anne Marie facilitates engagement, or Yeager's president who comes in and talks about what they do and who benefits um, really drives that. And so, you know, the um, the initial load of having to say how do we get everybody to cross the bridge of caring is gone, but then. You know what? What we have to worry about is how do we then rein this in and do something productive with it. You know, and that's and that's difficult because, you know, you have problems and, and want to save the world. And you know, so Rachel and I are able to speak with um, the community partners months and and months beforehand and talk about their problems. And you know, so this year we we met with three, hoping to find two, and and we got done and we're like, we want to work with all three. 
right? So we ended up having three projects this year because, you know, we got engaged on what was happening and what we could do. Um, so in terms of lab, it's it's really kind of interesting yet um, interesting, <laughs> both 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 good and with a question mark at the end of it because. Um, it's outstanding for these guys to take and plan what they're doing. Again, I love that we can move away from the cookbook. It's just like a research problem, but you know, and it's and it's so funny that you can tell that Rachel and I focus on different parts of the course. You know, she says that it's all about communication. If you ask me, I would say it's all about solving problems and troubleshooting, um, because that's what we do in, in the portion that I have you. That like you walk in and nothing went well, and I say so. What do you think happened? Where do we go from here? What's going to happen if you do this? You know, like we were chatting this morning about like hypotheticals and what's and what's going to work. So, you know, that we can go through and troubleshoot, and troubleshoot. Um, on the back side of that, it's difficult though because you never know what's coming. You know, so with the traditional lab, we can look and say, ah, we've got 50 students, we need this many plates, and we need this much stuff, and these cultures. It's all going to grow and it's all going to work, and and we don't get it even when we buy things. Sometimes they don't work well for us. As we're supposed to have. So, but you know, I think that um, part of the, the ups and downs and in and outs is what, what makes it a real life class. If, if everything just shows up and works, it sure as heck is not what happens in the next step of your life in a research lab or in a real job. So, um, you know, I, I really appreciate that that we have that and that it creates this real situation, but but still in kind of a more controlled, reined in environment that. Um, you know, you can take risks and you can try and, you know, like Sean said, he can sort out how he thinks he can solve the problem. And the standard caveat that we have is that it can't take a lot of time and it can't cost us a lot of money. As long as, as, long as it fits under those two umbrellas, you can do whatever you want um, as long as it's based on it, at least some sort of idea of, of what might happen. And so I, I think that that's very productive for us that it gives a real experience of seeing what it's like to have control and, and run your own project and to do some real science that you can engage on. And, um, you, you know, and there are a lot of intangibles that I'm sure that you'll talk about that, um, that we don't plan for, that, that we kind of hope students get as they go through college, that you really get here like working as part of a team and communicating with one another and collaborating and troubleshooting and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, I think that that's how it's different than most of, of what we would typically look at as coursework. Thank you so much, all of you. I was joking with the Acres group the other day that the best thing would be if we could make a documentary about the class. And the, the thing that would make it a great documentary is the fact that there's a lot of downs in with the ups, you know, things do not always go as planned. And that's something that, as a student, it's really hard the first few times that it happens because you are so used to the cookbook coming out right as long as you follow the recipe. And it is very different in that way. I have done full hour, Jerry will attest to the fact that we've, I've done full, longer than hour long presentations almost solely about assessment. And I will not and bore you with all of the assessment that we do, but I want to talk just a little bit about it. I've mentioned that there are extensive instructor rubrics that I use to assess their proposals as well as their lab notebooks. They also do self-assessment on lab notebooks and the peer mentors help with assessment on lab notebooks as well. We do assessment on the poster at the end, both uh, instructors, but then also external assessment as well. So there's a lot, and I would love to sit down, you know, Karen is one of our assessment experts for the, the new USP, and um, she and I may sit down at some point and talk rubrics just for fun. But I won't go too much longer into that, but I, I want to also know that the community partners get to assess the students. And so we get a lot of great feedback from our community partners, and our rubrics assess professionalism, communication, and whether or not they develop some sort of viable solution to their problem. And so in, in all those categories, our, our partners last fall or last spring assess our students as um, fulfilling those expectations. And um, I can have Peggy say a word if she's willing about that, but I will also um, read the comment from Acres assessment of the student. 
I was super impressed with how invested everyone was in the project and how much it mattered to them to find usable results for Acres. The presentation at the Acres meeting was an added bonus, so these are things that students have done on their own time. Um, as the group members were more than willing to take time out of their busy schedules to communicate their results to the Acres crew, this presentation was done very well and the students were careful to explain their project and the results in a way that was easily understood. It was also incredibly rewarding for me to see the presentation at the Acres meeting evolve into a dialogue between Acres, the students, and the instructors. And so, I don't know, Peggy, do you want to yell out just how your experience with the students? Yeah, well, I'll just say a couple of things. For me, it was, it was, it was a wonderful experience. And I really loved interacting with the students, but what I loved more was the practical advice that I received from my garden. Um, and my garden has been a really interesting platform for me to work with doing community-based work in. And last year, I grew food specifically for Feeding Linear Valley, which we share with community members, so low-income community members. And so what I was able to do is take that practical advice that you all gave me for increasing the productivity, and it was way cheaper than what I was going to do, right? So I was able to save money and then reproduce more food that we were then able to share. So for me, that was the beauty of it. I got some real grounded advice about what to do to increase my productivity. Cool. Thank you so much, so, so much. And this semester, Anne-Marie, after reading the proposal that the students from Downtown Clinic shared with her, she says, I just finished reading your proposal last evening and I really enjoyed it. I'm not a microbiologist and was concerned that I might not understand it. However, I'm pleased to report that I did, or at least I think I did. It was both logically and professionally written. I had not thought through, through how one might test a probiotic and I was fascinated with how you cultured out the various strains from true biotic and other commercially and naturally de delivered probiotics, and now using a local strain of clostridium difficile collected in a community sewage to test them. Cool. I really look forward to your final report, and, and Anne-Marie maybe doesn't do herself justice. She is um, she's both an FMP and a PhD, and so um, she really is an amazing assessor of our projects, and I think it was really uh, such a testament to the students' writing that she was able to take from it so much value. I also want to briefly share with you the quantitative data that we have from our external subject matter expert, looking at all the many categories in the rubrics that our external raters um, assess the students on, they found that on all of those categories, they found that they mastered a majority of the categories. Acres group actually um, scored 100% from all of our three, four different external raters, and our Laramie Gardens also received a high mastery at 87%. So this is our way of being able to share that our learning objectives are being obtained both by the view of the instructor but also by external subject matter experts. We also have focus group data throughout the entire term. We have Anne-Marie, or excuse me, we have um, 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 ECTL help us out with the um, with the the focus groups and um, we, we enjoy their feedback um, from the students throughout the term and we actually have a focus group that happens in each of the portions of instruction so we end up with four focus groups for every one of the phases of instruction and in the focus group data we actually saw pretty unanimous support and it was fun to watch the students transition in their thinking when they went through moments of frustration to moments of feeling a little bit more satisfied with how the project was going so all those things come through in the focus group data as well, and um, we've been really fortunate to have Meg Fleming and Skinner doing those with us as well. Um, the other thing that I just briefly want to comment on is that students really show the way that the community um, engagement, you know, plays a role in their level of fulfillment. And I think that the testaments that we've heard from the, the students are really more than I can do to than you know than what I can say to summarize these things. But I will read to you one quote that was that was by a student on the student evaluation. And this was actually the very first time that I was that John and I received five out of five on every category in the, the in the evaluations. And this was one of the quotes. 
And this was by far the most well-taught, stimulating, and most challenging course that I have taken at UW, and it was by far the best overall. The unique aspect of applying knowledge to solve community problems was central to this class and enhanced learning in many ways, as I not only learned lots of, quote, textbook knowledge, but I also learned volumes about real-world problem-solving, communication skills, and working as part of a team. So uh, that was just one of our testaments of the, of the class, and I can share more of those with anyone who might be at all interested. So with that being said, I don't think that Mara could have known when she said um, earlier that um, the, the big part of this class is thinking critically, but also building character. I don't think she knew that I picked out this particular Martin Luther King Jr. quote to share with you today. Uh, so the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. So I guess I have one last question to ask the panelists before we allow you guys to hit us with questions, and that is, does seeing social and environmental justice applications of research change your perceptions of benchtop science or the whole of science? And that's a pretty loaded question. Um, in that I'm kind of asking if this has changed the way that you perceive your role in science for the future. And particularly for those of you who finished Capstone last semester, has it already changed some of the ways in which you perceive science and where you're headed with science? Uh, so I guess I get to start again. <laughs> um, so I would say it's definitely helped affirm the way I thought of science. So coming into college, I'm like, I'm going to go do labs and I'm going to solve problems and it's going to be great. But I didn't always get that. And so having this course and seeing that, yes, I can actually you know, look at a problem and then come up with some kind of solution or advice to give someone has been really fundamental for me. And I guess my future goals have always been I want to go work for like a government agency. But the thing I've always seen is that like people that make our policies are completely disconnected from the people doing the actual science. And it, it drives me crazy. I, I even took a class where I was the whole time, I was like, why don't we try this molecular approach? Or why don't we try this micro approach? And why aren't they applying it in this field? And so being able to see that, yes, I can actually take what I'm doing on the bench top and apply it to a situation where maybe it's, maybe it's just a, and that, Increasing the production of a garden, but maybe you know it's how we treat our our fish hatcheries. We don't we tell them you don't don't just want to dump antibiotics in there because you think you have this bacteria. That it doesn't necessarily work like that. And so I'm really excited because this class has really shown me that I can actually be that middle person that goes from you know the hard science to the actual policies and change that you want to see. And this class has really affirmed that for me. And Sean, that's really something that I want to do. Something that I've, I've always known is that I have wanted to use science to better the world because I think that's the way to do it. Um, our world is kind of governed by the way science works. And um, so that's something I've always wanted to do. But it's hard to keep that in mind when you're doing research. When you're investigating certain things, there, there are moments when things don't work out, and you're just like, why am I doing this? And you kind of stop care. Um, and that's something in this class that has never happened. Um, there have been lots of times where we've run into roadblocks, and we don't know how to quite get over them. But there's always been that reason in the back of my mind for why I'm doing it. I can, I'll be able to see the results of that. I know that um, it will affect people that I might know, or that um, I know that it has impacts in my own local community. And that, that's a driving force in keeping me motivated in um, times where there's going to be issues. Because with every lab, there's always going to be some issues somewhere. And this is it, knowing that it will help somebody, um, and knowing directly that it will help somebody is a really good inspiration. And this class has helped um, me realize that. And, and going off what Sean said, I mean, there's real problems. They're real people who make a real difference. And I think it made a difference in my learning. So. Also, with the course, I took things that I learned directly from the course and put them right into an internship at a company in Centennial, Colorado, which 
I played for yesterday. Um, pretty good indications that I'll probably get that job. And, and you have one this summer. Yeah, well. I have the internship this summer, and then I'm graduating in May. I applied for a position at that company. I should be getting that position. So. I guess the only thing I would add is that um, any other course I've taken that's in a lab hasn't had a goal at the end. It's it maybe just getting an A on the lab report, but that's about it. And this course, the semester long course, has that end all goal at the end of the semester. So I know that even if this research doesn't isn't successful in accomplishing what we hypothesized, but even that other failure to it um, would also reach the goal of just being insightful into how this research played out and what I learned from this entire long semester, not just the paper at the end, but really um, being able to see step by step what can be taken from solving a community problem on the bench top. So um, I'll just add to this a little bit. I think a lot of what these guys are saying um, really kind of speaks to what we hope to get. But something that I think um, we also gain out of this, and, and largely through struggles, is the vision of how it really works to be in the sciences, right? That, that you don't find a problem and then six weeks later it's it's all solved. You know, I mean the fact that we could give Peggy some advice and she could actually um, have better yields and make better decisions in her garden, it's outstanding. But you know, um, Acres last year we did the project, we came to some results, but largely our system was flawed. And so we sort that out and it lets us do the next project and we do the next project. And so, you know, I think that you know it also lets you have that vision of what it's really like that you're just moving the conversation along you're able to add to it and you know as a student in academia that you have the power to do that um, you know and then you know with with Amy's thoughts on, on um, you know policy and things like that I mean really and this is where I love that Rachel's main focus is communication because anytime that we as scientists can speak to somebody about it um, in a, a better or a more efficient way and make it accessible um, to individuals who aren't necessarily in the field, I think we all win from that. Um, and, and then I think that it, it allows us to fight for the little guy a little better, or, or for them to fight for themselves. Um, that we really gain, even if we're just moving it, you know, centimeters down the field at a time, it's still meaningful and forward. So I have a, a lot of references to share with her, and I won't go through all of them, but I would like to open up for questions at this point, and I want to say thank you for coming, and I, I hope that we also had a lot of people attending on, online. I know this was the stream session, and so I hope that, that that was also well attended, and if they hopefully can come to with questions to us as well. So uh, any questions for the panelists, but I also want to definitely say a huge thank you for them to be here. Some of them had to miss class today, one of this, and so this is a pretty big deal, and it's a very big deal to me to have their voices heard, and I think when we're, our theme of the Shepherd Symposium this time is everyday oppressions, and it's amazing to me, just as Claire testified to, that we meet every morning at 7 a.m., and at about 6.50 the other morning, one of my capstone students hit me with a horrible encounter that she had had with a professor in which he had made a blatantly racist statement. And so I know that capstone is not entirely, or that much of capstone is about the science, but much of capstone is also about having a community of learners. And the support system that we could have been to her that morning at 6.55 a.m. is also a part of what Capstone Course is, is a community of people who, when they're in the hardest time of their undergraduate career, which is making decisions that affect their life forever, that they have a group of people to see that they kind of like every morning at 7 a.m. And that sometimes we get to talk about things that aren't necessarily inherently science. 
And uh, finding those futures within the CAPSA course, I think, is, I think it helps. So thank you, and then I will let you ask questions. <laughs> Uh, so like I was saying before, my goal has always been I want to go work for a government agency and be that middle person between science and policy. And so I'm graduating in May, and so I've started um, filling out I don't know how many applications on USA Jobs for like Forest Service, BLM, National Park Service. Basically, anyone that will take me at this point, because government agencies, you kind of need government experience to really move forward. Um, but my goal with that is that I really want to get into something to do with water quality. Uh, it's kind of the area I'm really interested in. And so if I can get established in that area, then I'd like to be able to come back to grad school and take a problem that maybe I've found out in the field and study it in a grad program. And actually, I think Capstone is kind of leading the way this semester with the Game of Fish project. Um, I can directly see, it's like, okay, th there's a lot of study that could really be done on this issue that I think would really benefit, like, the way we Game of Fish. And so hopefully it'll turn into something, maybe a grad project. But first I want to get established in a government agency and ask, what problems do you have that I can go study and learn more about and then you know, report back? kind of my end goals. So something that I'm uh, fairly passionate about is fungi. I really like fungi, and I think they're super neat. And that's something that this class let me explore around with a little bit. Originally, we hadn't intended to look um, for fungi at all in our compost. It wasn't something that we had thought about. And that's something I pushed for pretty, uh, pretty adamantly about this semester. And something we changed about our culturing. And so now we're looking at the fungal populations of our compost. And that's something that I'm hoping I can take those skills and apply to grad school at some point in time. Um, and look into a project of using fungi for things like um, remediation of uh, damaged soils or um, recycling of, of um, landfills or things along those lines. This class is giving me the, the uh, a subset of skills that will allow me to pursue that um, and, and in the meantime, right, tell them about what you're doing right now. Um, so my, my immediate plan is not to go to grad school right away. Um, right now, uh, I am planning on going teaching in uh, Micronesia for a year. Um, I will be teaching there. Um, and hopefully I'll be teaching science to uh, high school kids. Um, that's something that I'm extremely excited about. Um, I, I love science and I would love to be able to teach it to um, people who are in um, less fortunate educational status than what I was able to have when I was in high school. Um, and that's something that I'm super excited about. And um, I'm hoping that this class I'll be able to use some of the instructional techniques that, that John and Rachel have used and apply those to my teaching situation in, in the coming year. Um, so as far as future right now, I'm planning on grad school at some point, but for the next couple of years, I think I'm going to go into the workforce. Uh, I have a, I think I have a job lined up at this company, Allosource, in Centennial, Colorado. It's a tissue company, um, a human tissue company. So I'll be doing that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll be doing that, uh, but really what opened the door for me was this class. I had, like, I, had the, I had the experience before I had the experience with that company, before I had the internship, so I had experience with uh, keeping the scientific, you know, the scientific journal. Uh, I had experience with like, reduction, plating, and microbial counts, and I mean, for an entry level position, that is what I needed. That's what I have. So. Yeah. 
Um, well, my entire undergraduate career really teetered back and forth with what I want to do or what I could do. Um, I've narrowed it down a little bit more this semester, but um, I know I'm passionate about healthcare and um, different career fields that are in healthcare, even research. Um, and this semester, working with the downtown clinic or having the option to do that um, was something I was really excited about. And so even now, what I think is amazing about this course is that um, some of us are passionate about research and working um, in a lab. And But some of us, as you can see from the other students that have talked, um, have really taken this project. And I think it's really cool how it's been a balance of all of these different topics and all these different issues that we're trying to look at. And um, they all play into something that uh, we are all um, very interested in, whether it be healthcare or more soil sciences, um, food microbiology, wildlife. Um, I think it's really amazing how it's all worked out for us. And even if it's knowing that we are in lab eight plus hours a week and we don't want to be in lab eight plus hours a week, we know that these issues can also be um, very applicable to microbiology and can be taken at a community level, at a clinical level, um, at a field level. And so just knowing that, I think, in itself is really neat. So well, so really how are you there. doing now? What's next for you? Um, I'm really not sure. Oh, next year? Yeah, right. Oh, okay, <laughs> next year um, I'm going to um, UMass Amherst with the National Student Exchange. I am a junior, so I'll be spending some or all of my senior year there. Um, and I looked into programs throughout the United States that are um, within microbiology. Um, they have a really good program. It's a really great school. So um, I'm excited to see what their labs have to offer and their microbiology, molecular biology research have to offer. And hopefully that will just give me more insight onto narrowing down what I want to do in the future, like this semester definitely has. Well, I just have a couple of comments. What I'm sensing from you guys is that the capstone experience has instilled a level of confidence in that do you agree or disagree? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're confident in that. And, and also possibly help you in the decision making process where you want to go with your education. I, I think um, it's, uh, and, and I don't know too much about, about the, the programs as far as capstone. I know some programs around the country um, have integrated capstone courses in their program, but aside from capstone, um, I think very few, uh, if any, undergraduate science majors uh, have been able to experience a research environment. And in the case of Capstone, an applied environment, let alone a basic research environment, I think uh, to have a formalized type of, of, of research-based problem-solving, applied problem-solving course like this um, gives students an opportunity to, to experience that. And not only the, the, the euphoria, but also the frustration, um, which working on biological systems and trying to solve biological problems probably more often than not frustration. And Jerry, I will try to find out, um, at least in Try to find out for you how many programs do you have a capstone course. ASM does, you know, definitely suggest it, but yeah. I don't know that they have any numbers on. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I, mean, I, I think just Well, thank you everyone for being here and for all of our attendees. That's right. We're done. Sure. So I'm so happy this is the world has captured so I can send the link to Steve.